St. Vincent's Prime Minister describes as a sweet victory the country's election to the UN Security Council. Our top story in Caribbean Newsline for Friday, June 7, 2019. From the CMC News Center in Bridgetown, I'm Ricardo Roberts. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. St. Vincent and the Grenadines on Friday become the smallest country to be elected to the United Nations Security Council. The country won 185 votes to secure the required two-thirds majority for a seat on the council. The council is composed of 15 members. There are five permanent members, that's China, France, Russia and the United Kingdom and the United States and 10 non-permanent members elected for two-year terms by the General Assembly. St. Vincent joins Niger, Tunisia, Estonia, Vietnam among the non-permanent numbers who will begin their two-year term on January 1, 2020. The multi-island nation of 110,000 people said its bid was grounded in its respect for sovereignty, diversity of views, dialogue and peace and development. Now speaking after the vote, Prime Minister Ralph Gonzales said Kingstown is committed to the bedrock foundations of the UN Charter, namely sovereign equality, non-interference and non-intervention in domestic affairs and collective cooperation in solving global problems. Gonzales also stressed that St. Vincent and CARICOM remain committed to finding a peaceful resolution to the ongoing political unrest in Venezuela. Non-interference, non-intervention, peaceful settlement of the, the serious difficulties pertaining to governance. To have dialogue, we, su we support the, the process which is ongoing in Norway, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Last year, when there, was a, there were discussions in the Dominican Republic sponsored by the former president of Spain, his Excellency Mr. Zapatero, and also the President of the Dominican Republic, and blessed by the Holy Father, um, Pope Francis. We were selected as one of the six facilitators in that process. So we have a history of that. CARICOM has a position on this matter for dialogue and peaceful settlement of this problem, um, which is getting more difficult day by day. And we want a, a conversation. At least four people have died and several others missing after heavy torrential rains caused widespread flooding in Haiti over the last four days. The Directorate of Civil Protection, the DPC, says the damage was mainly in the west of the country. Now, according to the DPC, two people were killed in City Soleil. One person died in Cari 4. Three others were injured and three others missing. In Caribbean, one person died and another is reportedly missing during the heavy rains that have been falling since Tuesday. The authorities said that cattle had also been washed away in City Soleil. Several roads and bridges were also reported to be damaged. The DPC says preparations are being made to provide relief to those affected and that kits from the National Emergency Operations Center are being sent to the communes for distribution. It also urged residents, especially those in areas at risk of flooding and landslides, to stay away from the watercourses and not to cross under any circumstances the rivers being affected by the floods. Protest action by dozens of workers at the Caribbean Examinations Council, CXC, continued on Friday. The employees are taking issue with a restructuring exercise at the council. Barbados Today News reports that major restructuring changes started to unfold without notice and in the middle of negotiations with trade unions. It's reported that last week some workers were told that they Jobs would be made redundant at the end of June, while at least two others saw their positions advertised among numerous vacancies published on the CXC's website over the weekend. In a statement, the Barbados Workers' Union revealed restructuring discussions were to be continued on June 3, but CXC's management unilaterally determined the outcome when they posted advertisements for positions 
which were on the table for discussion. The statement added that it is unconscionable to post jobs currently held by persons on the market and those persons having no idea that their jobs are under threat. The BWU says it remains open to returning to the negotiating table. An investigation has been launched into reports of a rat infestation on a ward at the Spanish Town Hospital in St. Catherine, Jamaica. As we hear in this TVJ News report, a woman who was recently discharged from the hospital provided footage, uh, video footage confirming the infestation. Rats, arguably the largest some have seen, seemingly romping on the ward at the Spanish Town Hospital in St. Catherine. These pictures were sent to TVJ News by a woman who was a patient on Ward 3. She did not want to be identified, but she was one of several terrified females at the facility. She said for the few days she was there, she cringed as she had to endure seeing three to four rats roaming the ward during the day. But it gets worse. In the night, you have like more different, different um, beds. Sometimes they crawl up on the bed and see and go on the iron cross of the bed. And, and then, you know, they came back down and sometimes some of them run up on some person's bag and you have patients screaming. Screaming, naturally, as in addition to the discomfort, they feared all the health issues that could arise by sharing bed with rats. But for this patient, things got even worse, as her fear was realized one night while she slept. One of them bit my finger, eh? So after, after being awakened a bit, I went to the nurse and told the nurse that a rat bit me. And she said, um, if it's not caught, then she cannot do anything about it. So, well, I went back to bed and there, anyway, looking out for more rats to the policy. This patient, like the others on the ward, is upset as she says anything can go wrong with their health under these conditions. One patient was so terrified that her blood pressure went up and she had to be removed from the ward. Rat droppings are also a common sight on the ward, although she expressed satisfaction that the workers clean up regularly. Speaking of the workers, she says while patients can look to leaving the hospital, sadly, the workers have been forced to work with the rats. Some of them saw the rats and they were like, oh my God. And they were, they were this is nothing. I think they get used to it. TVJ News contacted CEO of the Spanish Town Hospital, Dwayne Francis, who says the rat infestation report was brought to his attention on Wednesday and it's now being investigated. However, he says corrective measures have been implemented, including setting dozens of bait stations and putting an extermination team in place. He says while the issue seems to be confined to Ward 3, there is no plan to relocate patients until the findings of the investigation are seen. You're watching Caribbean Newsline. Still to come, Bahamas Tourism Minister praises the performance of the tourism industry. We'll be right back. Welcome to this year's 50th Caribbean Broadcast Union Assembly on the island of San Andres. San Andres is a small archipelago located in between Jamaica and Panama in the Western Caribbean Sea. A lush, exotic island rich in culture, history, gastronomy, and breathtaking scenic views. Known for its beaches and seven colored crystalline waters, the island of San Andres will be proudly hosting this year's event. 
CBU members will enjoy top-of-the-line accommodations for an unforgettable experience in San Andres, connecting Caribbean nations through this year's 50th edition of the CBU Assembly. The tourism minister of the Bahamas is hailing the strong performance of the tourism industry over the past year. Now speaking during the 2019-2020 debate, Minister Dioncio Diagola pointed to exceptional numbers recorded for cruise and stopover arrivals last year. And he said that the trend has continued so far this year. We get the details in this report from ZNS Network News. Dionisio de Aguila says the Bahamas continues to be on fire in the tourism sector, with significant increases being recorded for stopover and cruise ship arrivals last year. He said the tourism numbers also remain strong for the first four months of 2019. Almost 250,000 more people came to Nassau by cruise between January and April this year versus last year. So hopefully the merchants of downtown Nassau have been able to turn those additional visitors into additional sales. For the first four months of 2018, last year, stopover visitors increased by 14.1%. Well, Mr. Speaker, stopover visitors for the first four months of 2019 increased by another 17.7% on top of the 14.1% from last year. Cooking with gas, Mr. Speaker, cooking with gas. <laughs> and the good news is going all around so far this year. For the first four months of 2019, Nassau is up a whopping 21.5% on top of the 16.5% from last year. Diagola said that success in New Providence and the Family Islands is being driven by new edgy, innovative campaigns launched by Ministry of Tourism staff, the strong U.S. economy, and the completion of the Bahama Resort. He said the strong tourism figures will also translate into more employment opportunities and more money in the pockets of Bahamians. And with pending industrial action in the hotel sector, Diagola urged both sides to negotiate in good faith so as not to harm the tourism industry. Industry. Local, regional and international artists along with some celebrities shared the stage in Antigua and Barbuda last weekend for a global concert with a major purpose. It was titled Play It Out and the artists and patrons did just that. We get the details from Dawn Paris in this week's Newsline Entertainment. Imagine this. Soka King Marshall Montano, American R&B artist Ashanti, Australian singer Cody Simpson, Norwegian R&B act Nico and Vince, Grammy-nominated German DJ producer Robin Schultz, Ghana's premier reggae artist Rocky Dawuni, and Antiguan soca artist Ricardo Drew and Claudette Peters, all on one stage in the Caribbean, performing for thousands of people for free. It's not a usual occurrence on the entertainment scene, but neither was Play It Out. It wasn't just another concert, it was a festival with a cause to raise awareness about and beat plastic pollution. At an almost 12-hour event co-hosted by American actress Megan Good and social media influencer Amanda Cerny, artists from around the world put on a show for those gathered at the Savivian Richards Cricket Stadium last Saturday and into Sunday morning.
The event was a major initiative in a campaign launched by the President of the UN General Assembly, Maria Fernanda Espinosa, and was a partnership between her and the governments of Antigua and Barbuda and Norway. Espinosa said the Twin Island Nation was chosen to host the event because it's leading by example worldwide, passing legislation to ban two of the biggest culprits of ocean pollution, single-use plastics and styrofoam. And in case you didn't quite get it the first time, the concert wasn't just free to patrons. The artists themselves actually performed pro bono as well. But how easy was it to convince these usually high-paid entertainers to give up their time and talent for free? They are artists, uh, they are very successful, and at the same time they are very committed. You know, they are part of humanity, they want uh, a cleaner and safer environment for themselves and for their children as well. So it wasn't that, uh, that difficult. Don Paris, Newsline Entertainment. And ahead in Newsline Sport, West Indies captain Jason Holder bemoans irresponsible shots following his side's loss to Australia. Stay with us, sport is next. Jamaican dancehall star was Beanie Man and Bounty Killer will perform on stage together at this year's event in what is gearing up to be an epic tune for tune 90s recall segment. The announcement was made via Sunfest website and the fan reaction has been overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive, as this represents the very first time that these two longtime rivals have ever been built to showcase all the songs which made them popular. You are watching Caribbean Vibrations TV, and we are coming to you from the beautiful Mahi Island in the Seychelles with the gentleman affectionately known as Creole King of the Islands, Mr. Patrick Victor. How are you doing today, sir? Feeling great, especially with this thing in my hand. Oh, well, I mean, ironically, that is your claim to fame. For people who do not know, back a little time ago, you had a song called Tabo Musha, which spoke about two different things in those two different words. And the other one, what are you doing this thing? Never ever like this. Mother Nature sent, I'm sure. You must be a special gift. Who told you to bring back the hair, the clothes, and the heels? I'm not the one. I'll be doing your life. West Indies captain Jason Holder was left ruined irresponsible shots which contributed to his side's failing run or failed runs chase and eventual 15-run loss at the hands of Australia in the second match of the World Cup on Thursday. Now chasing 289 for victory at Trent Bridge, West Indies collapsed from 190 for 4 in their 35th over to 273 for 9 of their allotted 50 overs after losing 5 wickets for 66 runs. Here's what Jason Holder had to say. Learning just needs to take place. You know, guys just need to learn from the mistakes that they make. Um, you know, take a little bit more responsibility in chasing, especially. You know, just need to take responsibility, and it's important that one of the top four batters be there at the very, very end. I think one thing that we could take from the Australian's performance is that Steve, you know, batted quite deep, and that's something that we need for a little bit more from our top order. I think Shea Hope has been outstanding in that regard, you know, but. It didn't go his way today, you know. I think credit must be given to Australia. I thought they came back and bowled really well with the old ball. 
I know created problems for us, you know, we had to decide what we wanted to do in terms of playing it or, t or taking it on or, you know, just knocking it around, you know, but credit must be given. Now, Holder said while the defeat was disappointing, he hoped his side could use it as a learning moment as they progressed in the tournament. West Indies all-rounder Carlos Braffitt has criticized the poor standard of umpiring that marred Thursday's 15-run World Cup defeat to Australia. The 2016 T20 World Cup final hero described the officiating as a bit frustrating and said some of the decisions had been dodgy. The Caribbean side were forced to resort to DRS on four occasions to overturn umpiring errors and TV replays also showed that New Zealand official Chris Gaffney missed a huge Mitchell Stark no ball, the delivery prior to Chris Gale's dismissal. Now, Gale was the first beneficiary of two successive howlers from Gaffney in the third over of the West Indies runs chase from Stark. The veteran left-hander was first adjudged caught behind and then given out LBW, the next legitimate delivery, decisions that were overturned by the DRS. Captain Jason Holder also suffered the same fate at the hands of Sri Lankan umpire Ruchia Paliagaruch when he was twice given out LBW, first in the 30th over and then by 36th over before DRS once again came to the rescue. Braffitt said both the umpiring and West Indies' luck with the technology at times had left him mystified. However, Holder said West Indies had been unlucky with the officiating but opted to stay clear of the controversial issue. Well, I was a bit unlucky to be on the other end at all the decisions. Um, you know, I guess honest mistakes from the umpires. I don't want to get into the officiating part, you know, but it's just ironic or <laughs> I don't even know what to say about it. But it's just a, a funny situation where all of them went against us and then we had to review them, but uh, I guess that's part of the game again. And not a ball was bowled on Friday in the match between Pakistan and Sri Lanka after persistent rain drenched the county ground at Bristol. The game was scheduled to start at 10.30 a.m. British Standard Time, but was called off at 3.45. The no result on Friday meant that points were shared between the both teams, putting Sri Lanka and Pakistan into third and fourth place respectively. Pakistan's next assignment is on Wednesday, June 12, against Australia at Taunton, while, Sri Lanka's, while Sri Lanka will take on uh, Bangladesh at Bristol on June 11th. Now, Dante Brinchman scored the only goal of the game as Bermuda defeated Guyana 1-0 in a hard-fought friendly at the National Stadium on Thursday night, with both countries preparing to take their debuts in this month's CONCACAF Gold Cup. A low right foot, footed shot saw Bermuda breaking the first half and broke the deadlock in the 37th minute. Both teams made uh, a host of substitutions after the break as Bermuda held on to secure a fifth straight victory to the delight of a large crowd. Bermuda's co Bermuda coach Kai Lightbourne says he was pleased with the team's performance. Um, we our first half, we controlled the game. We, 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 a lot of the things that we worked on, we saw it come out. and. Um, so I was pleased with that second half, we sort of lost our way, we made a few substitutions and then sometimes that happens and I think they, they may have had a little talking to at halftime because they, you know, we were, I thought we controlled the game really well first half, but second half they came out, they pressed us a little higher up the pitch, um, forced us into a few mistakes, but I was really pleased with the way we defended tonight, I thought we defended really well. Now, Bermuda has won their last four matches leading up to the Gold Cup. Lightbourne hopes his charges will keep the momentum up during the tournament. It's always good to win, you know. Uh, and I think we're, we're one on merit in, in these games. Um, we've been able to keep clean sheets in most of them. Last game before us was a penalty, and, and then the game before that was a fluke, fluke sort of goal. So, our defending has been, been good. We want to keep that up and be able to stay in the games un until the end. Now, Bermuda finished fifth in the CONCACAF Nations League qualifiers, two places above Guyana to book their Gold Cup place. They are in Group B, where they have been pitted against Costa Rica, Haiti, and Nicaragua. The Gold Cup runs from June 15th to July 7th. Over to Athletics Now, new chairman of the Caribbean Regional Anti-Doping Organization, Patrick Whalerman, has 
highlighted compliance of members as one of the main objectives of his tenure. HGP's Jaden Samuels reports. Will Armand, the board member representative for Aruba, has been elected to serve for the next term following the 14th annual board meeting in Tortola, British Virgin Islands, on June 2, 2019. Will Armand, who is also director of sports development of the Aruban Olympic Committee and president of the Aruba Anti-Doping Commission, says compliance with World Anti-Doping Code will be one of his major priorities for Caribbean RADO member countries. Outgoing Chairman Dr. Adrian Lord, who did not seek re-election, thanked the body for the confidence placed in him since he took up the helm in 2005. Dr. Lord, who is the board representative for member countries Barbados, will still serve on the executive committee, having been elected as its new vice president, a role in which he is pleased to contribute. As the World Conference is coming up in November in Poland with a new code coming into being in 2021, there will be a need for expert leadership in the region to guide our countries for the forward and to keep them compliant. The new chair, Patrick Wellerman, has made tremendous strides in the time he has been involved and I think the Caribbean Rado is in very good hands. And that's the sports table. That's we'll be right back. The Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. Welcome to this year's 50th Caribbean Broadcast Union Assembly on the island of San Andres. San Andres is a small archipelago located in between Jamaica and Panama in the Western Caribbean Sea. A lush, exotic island rich in culture, history, gastronomy, and breathtaking scenic views. Known for its beaches and seven colored crystalline waters, the island of San Andres will be proudly hosting this year's event. CBU members will enjoy top-of-the-line accommodations for an unforgettable experience in San Andres, connecting Caribbean nations through this year's 50th edition of the CBU Assembly. Please tell us. There's so many different types of law. What made you specialize in getting people who have disabilities their claims approved? My father owned an insurance brokerage business in Maryland. And after he came back from World War II and started this business, he purchased a disability insurance policy, thinking he'd never need to have that policy. Well, unfortunately, he became disabled. And I saw him struggle with that difficult decision to stop working and apply for disability. But never ever like this. Mother Nature sent, I'm sure. You must be a special gift. Who told you to bring back the hair, the clothes, and the heels? I'm not the one. I'll be doing your life. In the major developments of this day, St. Vincent's Prime Minister describes as sweet victory the country's election to the UN Security Council. And the sport West Indies captain Jason Holder bemoans irresponsible shots following his side's loss to Australia. That's Caribbean Newsline for news and sports around the cloud. Subscribe to carlinews.com. For more of our programming, log on to Carib Vision TV and check out our YouTube channel. We'll be back here again on Tuesday, but from all of us at CMC News, thank you for watching. Have yourselves a good night.